Hello there, you are watching Talking Europe on France 24. I'm Catherine Nicholson and today I'm joined by the Minister for the European Union from Spain, uh, Luis Marco Aguiriano Nalda. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Now, uh, you've been in the job since June in the cabinet of the new socialist Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez. Uh, just to remind of you, as Pedro Sanchez uh, came to be Prime Minister after his predecessor, Mariano Rajoy, lost a confidence vote. He was mired in scandals over corruption. Uh, you have come into the job at a particularly busy time for European affairs. Indeed. Catalonia continuing to rumble, uh, Brexit worrying many people, uh, people in Gibraltar as well, we'll talk about that, uh, and continued arrivals of undocumented migrants, particularly into Spain. I'd just like to start there with some news from the last few days. Uh, there's been flash flooding in Mallorca, the Spanish island, that's killed several people. Uh, as your Prime Minister said, there is an urgent need to find missing people, help people flooded out of their homes. Uh, what kind of help and resources is being sent there? Well, it's, it's indeed a, a drama and uh, all the resources are being mobilised, including probably uh, if needed, but uh, there's already offers from other uh, countries, partners and friends. As usual, the European solidarity in these cases is really uh, important and uh, Despite the, the, the sadness and the impression caused, uh, we are trying to tackle all the consequences. Uh, of course, some of them cannot be mended. Uh, but, but it's certainly one more lesson uh, about the necessity to take urgent decisions against climate change, which is exponentially accelerating, despite what Mr. Trump tries to believe or make us believe. Now, this comes at a time when work is going on in the EU to create a civil protection force uh, to react in times of natural disasters. I take it that's something that you would back? Absolutely, indeed. Uh, what, what Europe does best is sharing uh, capabilities and using the best practices of each of its member states. And indeed, as you said, a civil protection mechanism uh, is being consolidated. It exists already and is being uh, foreseen in the next budgetary framework with uh, increased means, I think, duplication or something mm -hmm. of the sort. Well, let's move on to the topic of the coming days. Uh, the big dominant topic, topic, I assume, will be Brexit uh, summit in Brussels uh, on Wednesday evening. Uh, from your point of view, can we expect a deal to be announced this week? I think we can reasonably be uh, pragmatically <laughs> optimistic. I spoke to Michel Barnier recently. He had been... Uh, he had been in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, in the UK, with all the possible interlocutors and, uh, and being cautious as he, as he must be. He said that uh, we are closer than ever to an agreement and it might be possible to reach that agreement uh, in the next European Council. Uh, let's hope he's right. My British friends and, uh, and, uh, and co-negotiators on the Gibraltar question are lately also reasonably uh, optimistic. Mrs May went out reinforced from her party conference and, and has a larger margin of manoeuvre than she had before mm -hmm. and during the Salzburg summit. OK, well, let's talk particularly about Gibraltar. Some reporters from here at France 24 went to The Rock recently to find out what Gibraltarians, what Spanish people who work there uh, think about the situation. This is from Chris Moore and Karim Yayoi. The Rock of Gibraltar, a strategic gateway to the Mediterranean, a mere 14 kilometres from Morocco. Just the other side of this runway is Spain. For three centuries, this speck of limestone has been a British overseas territory, and the Crown's influence is plain to see. But its population of 34,000 has roots that reflect its position as an international crossroads. By a statue of British naval hero Horatio Nelson, local historian Tito harks back to 1967 and an overwhelming vote in favour of UK sovereignty. We call it Referendum Gate. As a reminder of the big referendum we had, to say that we don't want to be Spanish. <laughs> OK. And you still don't want to be Spanish? No, no way. It's an identity based on proud exceptionalism and a fierce sense of separateness from Madrid, which maintains its right to the rock. Over at government headquarters, they seem more concerned about the logistics of Brexit. Well, the people of Gibraltar are enthusiastic Europeans. 96% of us voted to remain within the European Union. So obviously, we are in a position where we don't want to be. We find ourselves leaving the European Union because the UK voted to leave. Our debate is about the movement of people, how people are going to cross that border once we are no longer in Europe. Every day, more than 10,000 Spaniards come in from neighboring La Linea, where unemployment stands at 40%. For locals like Lorenzo, Gibraltar's an economic lifeline he's seen cut off before. 
when Spain was a dictatorship. Buenísimo. Muy, muy bueno café. My life is very bad because here nobody, nobody's got a job. I have to go to Gibraltar and I, w I don't like going every day. I would like to work here, but there are no jobs here. As the flight from London lands, it's business as usual on the runway. But both Gibraltar and the Spaniards who depend on it are waiting nervously on the impact of a vote that took place 2,000 kilometres to the north. Uh, regarding Gibraltar, what exactly is the Spanish government looking for? Well, Gibraltar is a territory was yet was now the, the second or third GDP per capita of the world. 25,000 inhabitants, 35,000 companies registered there, uh, wealth. And uh, this is accompanied by uh, um, some disloyal competition, uh, some uh, smuggling of uh, tobacco, uh, fiscal uh, opacity at times, uh, some uh, measures uh, not respecting the norms of uh, uh, environmental standards of the European Union, uh, some disputes on the fisheries rights of the neighbourhood. So the Spanish government wants in agreement with uh, the UK uh, authorities to, to settle that. Uh, not talking, we're not talking about sovereignty. Uh, there is a long time of transition between the agreement of Brexit and the future relation and we are ready to talk about everything and we will see what we decide in the interest of, of, of everybody in the region from one side or the other of, uh, of the fence. And certainly uh, taking into account that Gibraltarians voted uh, against Brexit by 95%. And there are suspicions for many people that Spain is going to try and use Brexit to make a claim on Gibraltar to get more control over what happens on that territory or even something, try and subsume it into Spanish territory. Is that the case? This is not on the agenda. Uh, we're not talking about that uh, far from it in this moment. We're talking about very concrete things that uh, you and I just mentioned. Is your government prepared to actually veto Brexit, not ratify the final withdrawal deal, if you're not seeing what you want over Gibraltar? We very much hope we will not have to reach that uh, uh, situation and that dilemma question. The European Union has clearly uh, stated that uh, now they are completely on our side on the, of the negotiation. It's not Spain alone, it's the European Union. And Michel Barnier has made it clear to our uh, British friends that uh, there can't be a Brexit if there isn't an agreement on Ireland on Cyprus and on Gibraltar. So Spain could veto Brexit? I don't think we'll, uh, we'll ever get there. But in politics, uh, like in life, not everything is foreseeable. Indeed. Well, some people worrying about their future, Spanish people living in the UK and Brits in Spain, between 300 and 800,000 uh, British people currently in Spain, it's believed. Uh, can the rights of British people in Spain be guaranteed by your government at this point? People do feel that they're being used as bargaining chips. They can, they should, they will, hopefully. Uh, it's been made... Uh always very clear by this government, uh, the current government in Spain. Uh, Cabinet Minister Lidington was recently in Spain and we spoke about all these uh, questions. Uh, it's the first priority not only of Spain but of the rest of the European uh, Union to guarantee the same rights for citizens after Brexit. We've offered including uh, the possibility to continue by a bilateral agreement to have British citizens in Spain Mm -hmm. being able to vote in the local elections and being elected. We have some mayors uh, from your nationality in Spain. But you're not prepared to guarantee those rights until the UK makes a move on European citizens living in the UK? On Gibraltar, whatever happens, the right of the citizens will be guaranteed mm -hmm. as they are. Let's look at some other news uh, from the last few days. Uh, Transparency International and Global Witness, two NGOs, have been talking about uh, what's known as golden passport schemes. Several of them exist around the European Union. Spain affords residency rights to people who invest to a certain level of investment in Spain. Uh, these NGOs say that this can be a portal for crime and corruption into the EU. Do you believe this is a fair reflection of the situation in Spain? Well, there are many uh, urban legends about this phenomenon. Uh, it's been on the agenda a couple of years ago very much. It's not very much talked about for the moment in Spain. 
Uh, it is, and this government is not in favor of that kind of phenomenon, but it's really not a, a priority or a, or a big worry at the moment. Well, this scheme does bring a lot of money into Spain. It's estimated more than 900 million euros annually. Uh, the NGOs say that governments around the EU are not being vigilant. Can we say that governments such as yours are turning a blind eye to this problem because it is bringing in money? Well, it varies from country to country. I'm not going to name and blame. Uh, but looking at your own government, for example. Uh, our own government is not going to close an eye uh, uh, on that and is going to follow that very, very closely. Again, I am not a specialist myself, but it's not something which is between the urgencies and priorities of the current government. We've seen demonstrations in Catalonia once again in September, calls for another referendum on independence. Is another referendum a possibility? A referendum only for Catalonia and only by Catalans, no, except if it's a, a referendum on the statute of autonomy or uh, if there is a referendum, for example, on a revision of the Spanish constitution. But if there is a referendum uh, aiming at changing the frontiers, uh, the borders of, of, of our country, it must be decided by all Spanish citizens, not only by Catalans in this case. Uh, I know that the minority government that you're a member of does uh, rely on some Catalan separatist support. Uh, there have been threats from certain Catalan separatist elements to not vote through the national budget that's coming up uh, over the issue of uh, independence. Is your government prepared to make some concessions to get the national budget through? Well, again, in politics, uh, everything or almost everything is, is, uh, is, uh, is possible or at least has to be considered as hypothesis. Depends what the concessions are. are. If the concessions have nothing to do with the budgetary policy and consist uh, in uh, making declarations on the political situation in Catalonia or the, or the situation of uh, of, uh, of uh, some of the uh, um, actors who, who, are, who are in jail. We think it has absolutely nothing to do. This has to mm. be discussed in certain fora, not in the budgetary discussion. Well, there have been calls for several politicians jailed over uh, the pro-independence action of last year uh, to be freed for prosecutors to drop charges. Uh, you don't agree then that those charges should be dropped? It's not that I agree on or I don't agree. You started the interview by reminding us all that the, the previous government uh, fell, not least, but certainly uh, uh, for, for a very uh, important proportion uh, because of uh, corruption and because decisions by the justice. Mm. I think that's the best uh, agree uh, argument to, to show that the government is not influencing or controlling the, the independence of the judiciary power because it fell because of the decision of the judges. So the independence of justice is very much guaranteed in Spain. Then you can have personal opinions, as last some ministers have expressed, uh, regretting that the process, uh, um, the legal process uh, is, is long, uh, hoping that we had never come to that solution, but mm -hmm. that's not a pressure on the justice, that's the opinion of a, a personal opinion of a human being. At the same time, having those people behind bars, does that not exacerbate the situation? Well, it does. As a matter of fact, uh, the independentists uh, in their huge majority don't have a message anymore because after one year they're turning in circles. Then the only message they are using uh, uh, the, uh, insistingly is the situation of, of, of their friends in jail. There is now evidence of a rift in the separatist coalition that's governing Catalonia. Uh, they've got just 61 of the 135 lawmakers, well below the majority. Should there be a new election in Catalonia? Well, probably they should uh, if, if the situation goes on for a while. But on the other hand, as a, a prestigious journalist told me the other day in Barcelona, what, what for do they want a majority? In any case, they've never proposed any law uh, taking care of the... Uh, everyday life of, this, of their citizens. They're only obsessed by one thing, which is the process of uh, independence, uh, so-called. So there might be new elections. Should there be, well, in principle, uh, and uh, we look at our own uh, situation, uh, we, we favor stability, but we favor stability uh, in the management of all the problems of a country or a region, not, not stability in insisting on something which is illegal. Well, another issue, uh, this year Spain, the single country taking in the highest number of migrants, uh, sea arrivals, uh, numbering over 30,000 at least. Uh, do you believe 
believe that uh, Spain can continue to take in this high number of migrants into the European <laughs> Union, or is it time for other European countries to, to step up, change the system? Well, there have been already agreements, there are ad hoc agreements of, uh, let's say, uh, distribution of these arrivals arrivals, arrivals uh, in, into different countries. We are trying with our friends and partners to uh, stabilize and institutionalize a mechanism with objective criteria of assuming these, uh, these new people arriving. So no more case-by-case -case basis? You want a real system? That's exactly system. what we are trying, and there will be some proposals and, and, and presentations and debates in the, in the next European Council. Um, in any case, the figures uh, are provoked uh, mainly by uh, the new policy of the Italian government, which has de facto closed the uh, Oriental Mediterranean mm. route and transferred movements uh, to the West. But Spain has a long experience on that, uh, can, can manage with its neighbors of North Africa and uh, West Africa, and is now uh, certainly uh, helped with responsibility and solidarity with an increasing members of the European Union. Do you believe it's time for Italy's hardline interior minister, Matteo Salvini, to soften his stance? Do you believe that maybe he's made his point over migrants and he, he could start to soften his stance? Or, or is he going to keep going in this same fashion? Well, Mr. Salvini says things which are quite different depending uh, on uh, whether he's talking uh, or if he's debating questions uh, uh, with other representatives of other member states or, or other fora, like the recently for, uh, for Forum Ambrosetti. Mm -hmm. um, it is true that he's uh, climbing up in the opinion polls, so that's certainly an element which counts a lot for a politician, uh, but he's also somebody realistic, and must be, he cannot fight all the fight all the time, and he will have to uh, uh, um, come to uh, softer positions, not least because, in fact, uh, despite some speeches, Italy is not going to leave the European Union and doesn't want to leave the European Union. All right, well, that's where we have to leave our interview. Thank you very much, uh, Luis Thank Maduro, Aguiriano, Naldo. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, too, for watching the programme. We'll see you soon here on France 24 for more European news. St. Martin is a tiny island paradise, once the epitome of luxury tourism. But in September last year, disaster struck the island in the French Antilles. Hurricane Irma raised everything in its path. The poor were left in utter destitution. But one year later, how is St. Martin coping? Our reporters have been there to meet the local people. St. Martin still recovering a year after Hurricane Irma. Let's revisit it on France 24.